Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Adventures in Angular show. This week on our panel, we have Alyssa Nichol. Hello, hello. Joe Eames. Hey, everybody. I'm Charles Max Wood from devchat.tv. Quick shout out about Angular Remote Conf. We also have a special guest this week, and that's Ryan Chenke. Hello, hello, everyone. You want to give us a brief introduction? Sure thing. So my name is Ryan Chenke. I work at Osseo. Uh, I'm a product owner there, and I take care of a lot of our documentation and integration samples. I'm a blogger and JavaScript trainer as well. Um, so I do a lot of screencasting, uh, a lot of workshops. I've taught at Frontend Masters a couple times. And uh, I predominantly teach my at my own site, angularcast.io. That's where I do a lot of the screencasting. A lot of screencasts that I release these days go up to uh, to my site there, angularcast.io. So um, I'm mainly working with JavaScript. Mainly it's Angular and Node for me, but I dabble in some other things too, like PHP from time to time and uh, and that sort of thing. So that's me. Awesome. And I've been talking to you for a while about coming on the show to do an episode on Angular and Electron. Right, yes. Do you want to We've give been- us a brief introduction maybe as to how you got into that particular uh, technology stack? Sure. And so my introduction to that was really more um, out of an interest to start to look at how to bring Angular into use with some other technologies. Um, So, you know, I I dabbled in uh, Ionic in the past and when Electron started to, to gain some steam, and I'd come to find out that you can kind of use anything with it, any kind of front end technology that you want. Um, I, you know, got the idea since I was working a lot with Angular, why not try to try to use the two of them together? Um, I, I initially wrote a, a blog post about, about using Angular in an Electron application. And that was, uh, that was for Auth0 that I wrote that. That was when I was more focused on marketing content uh, at Auth0. So that was sort of the, the impetus there. I wanted to create some marketing content, uh, but also explore how to, how to bring these two things together. Gotcha. This episode is sponsored by Hired.com. Are you searching for a new job? That can be stressful, scary, and time-consuming. Pushy recruiters try to sell you on roles you don't actually want, and the job boards make you feel like you're throwing your resume into a black hole never to be seen again. And sometimes you go all the way through the interview process just to find out at the very end that the salary, offer, or company culture doesn't match what you're looking for. Hired is the world's most intelligent talent matching platform for full-time and contract opportunities in engineering development, design, product management, data science, sales, and marketing. We make your job search faster, focused, and stress-free. Instead of endlessly applying to companies and hoping for the best, Hired puts you in control of when and how you connect with compelling new opportunities. After completing one simple application, top employers apply to hire you. And on Hired, you receive personal interview requests and upfront salary information so you can make informed decisions about what what opportunities to pursue over a condensed timeline. Hired offers access to more than 4,000 innovative employers, including big brand names like Facebook and smaller emerging startups. The size and type of company you want to connect with is totally up to you. And we help you find new opportunities in 17 major cities in North America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. Open to relocation? Let them know. Your privacy and autonomy in your job search is of utmost importance. And if you go check them out at the show's link, that's Hired.com slash Adventures in Angular, you can get double their normal hiring bonus. So instead of $300, you get $600 for signing up at our link. That's Hired.com slash Adventures in Angular. So is it just as simple as including Angular in your Electron app, or is there more to it than that? So there's a little bit more to it than that. I mean, if you wanted to just wire up an Electron app with kind of a vanilla front end, so just, you know, regular old JavaScript, it's pretty simple. Um, you know, there's a, there's a couple of steps that you've got to go through to um, set up set up your, your project as it needs to be so that you can kind of run Electron against your project. But, uh, but it's really just a matter of setting up, um, you know, a JavaScript application as you, as you would for the browser. So with, with Angular, it, it, it's kind of like that. But where it gets a bit different is, especially if you're using the Angular CLI, you've got to arrange your CLI projects in a way where you can run Electron against your project. You've got to have the proper 
files in your distribution folder. Um, so there's a bit of orchestration, a bit of arrangement to be done there, but it works out to be pretty simple in the end. It's, it's not a whole lot of effort really. So, so, uh, I guess we should probably also do just a quick introduction to what Electron is. I don't want to assume that people just know what it is. Yeah, good point. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, Electron is uh, basically a platform that you can use to build cross-platform desktop applications. Um, basically, it's uh, it's a way to um, you know build once and distribute for Mac, uh, for Windows, and for Linux. And you do all of that using web technologies. Um, so it's uh, it's really nice if you want to build desktop applications, but you don't necessarily have experience building, you know, in in Objective C for for Mac, or you don't have experience building in something that is used in Windows. You can use the web technologies you already know and and still build desktop applications that way. Um, Basically, how it works is you, you've got um, you've got this the stack that runs Node, um, and it gives you a shell that uh, runs Chromium uh, within within this shell that you can then put your application out to. So it's basically this this window you get that that runs Chrome, and, and that's really how you're able to use your web technologies in there. Um, it's kind of you you build you build an application that is is basically just running a browser in the end. But you still have the ability to to do things with um, with native uh, with your your native OS. So you can you can use APIs from the OS that you're building for, um, but also the web APIs that, that you know as well. That makes sense. So how how would we get started with this? You install Electron, and then and then what? Ex- Exactly. So the, the first steps that you're going to go through when you're getting started, you're going to install Electron globally. So make sure you've got Node and NPM, and then you'll, you'll do a global install of Electron. Then there is the, the best way to get started for just seeing like a demo application, just a quick start application, uh, is to grab the actual quick start project that, the, uh, that is available from the Electron uh, GitHub organization. Uh, and this is just a really simple thing. It's got uh, just the, the minimal kind of boilerplate code that you need to to run an application. And what it looks like is you, you've got this you've got this kind of main file. This this main file has all of the code that is responsible for running the main process of the Electron application. And then you're going to have um, kind of a package.json file which instructs Electron where to look to to fire off and, and to wire up this main process. Um, and then you're just going to have uh, optionally a very simple view, which comes through a renderer process. Um, but I believe in, in the quick starts, uh, the quick start application that you get, there isn't actually a renderer process at play, but you can, you can use one if, if you want to. And a renderer process is basically this kind of, there, there, there are two, two main, there's two processes. There's the main process, which kind of fires up and, and wires up the application. And then there's kind of any number of renderer processes, which would be what you would see kind of, you know, w- what you would interact with. And so, so the best way, yeah, to answer your question, the best way to get started really is to just grab that quick start and, uh, and start to play with that. And it comes down to being pretty simple. You just have to basically run Electron against that, that main.js file that you end up getting in that quick start. And when you do that, you're going to get, you're basically going to get Electron fire up through uh, an application, like it becomes an application available in your, on your computer, on your desktop. And so you'll get a window that pops up right away and you can start interacting with it uh, immediately. So is this your first um, app or project using Electron or have you done a lot with it before in the past? So there's a couple. Uh, so that blog post that I mentioned, that was my first shot with Electron. And that was, um, it ended up being fairly simple. That, that the, the sample that I made for that blog post really <clears throat> did kind of one thing. You would grab some photos from your desktop, from a file folder somewhere, 
and drop them into the application. And all the all that this sample that I made would do is calculate the file sizes and display some information to you about those photos. So that was that was my first go at it. We did Lucas and I did a workshop at NGConf this uh, this year, 2017, where we uh, basically built an application that that went a lot further. We we did stuff like we enabled the webcam. People could take photos. People could save photos that they take. And uh, the other side of it too is we could do uh, like a screen capture, so we could capture the desktop. And that kind of got into more, some more um, of the kind of pieces that you have to bring in to make a full Electron application. In that workshop, we're talking about things like inter-process communication. So communicating between that main process that you get when you, you wire up your application, communicating, communicating between that and uh, the renderer process. And uh, so in that, that sample that we did for that workshop, we, we got to use um, some web APIs that dealt with things like turning the camera on, and then also some of Electron's modules that uh, did things like uh, allowed us to, to do desktop screen captures. So there's a, this module that comes with Electron called Desktop Capture, and we used it for that project. <clears throat> so I've... Um, I touched it in a few areas like that, more more kind of in the, in the demo realm. I uh, certainly haven't worked on any projects that um, you know put an electron application out to production, but I am a big fan of uh, the fact that we see that in a lot of the applications that probably all of us here use day to day. So things like Slack, uh, VS Code, those are both built with electrons. So those are some really kind of neat examples of how far you can go with with the stack. But personally, it's been more on the on the demo side. Okay, is it so? Electron is the thing that what is it that browsers also use, or they use something similar? Um, well, Electron would be kind of the this uh, framework, if you want to call it, that sort of orchestrates um, bringing together, giving giving you this 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 shell that you can run a browser within. And that, that shell gives you the ability to have a, a, a native application. It turns out to be a hybrid application because you're using, uh, you're using web technologies to make a desktop right. application. But it gives you kind of that, uh, that shell. So Electron kind of wires up and orchestrates all this. So you, you run it with Node. It you know, runs on a, a Node runtime. And then it gives you... A, gives you this this shell that get that has chromium running inside of it. So that's uh, that's where the browser comes into play. You've got the, you've got a browser basically. Like if you think about any kind of application that you'd be looking at on your desktop, you just think about the window, right? Um, with an Electron application, there's actually it, what you what you'd be seeing is is a browser. What you'd be interacting with is, is actually is actually uh, a browser, which is Chrome. Okay, no, I, I think it was Chromium that I was thinking of, which I guess Electron uses, and then I feel like Chrome also uses, maybe, or maybe I'm just making that up. But um, okay, so I've never personally used it before in a project. Yeah, so Chrome. you have much, much more experience than I do. I, I think Chromium, from what I understand, is essentially the open source version of Chrome. Or something right. very similar. The two projects are related in some way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, and that's what's run, you know, inside of an Electron project, basically. So you can, as soon as you're in an Electron project, you can see, like, you can open up DevTools. Um, you interact with DevTools as you would inside your Chrome browser. Um, in fact, you can, if you uh, have, you can even try this right now. If you've got Slack open, I think it only works if you are. If you if you picture Slack, if you are in multiple teams in Slack, there is this kind of left justified uh, sidebar that's got all the different teams that you're in. If you find some dead space in that that left sidebar and you give it eight clicks in a row, it's actually going to open up Dev Tools for you. So a little known secret about about Slack, but you'll be able to get to Dev Tools um, by just giving it eight clicks in that that left sidebar. So it looks like Chuck is trying it. <laughs> did you get it? Joe, you did? Cool. Eight clicks in yep. a row. Where do you... 
So you, you'd find where you, your teams list is uh -huh. and then down at the bottom. So find some dead space within that and just give it eight, eight clicks in a row. And it's going to, oh, uh, Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So there's depth, depth tools for, for Slack for you. So that's, um, right. So, so that's, that's Chromium, um, basically powering the Slack application. And, you know, it, it works out to be important, I think, in a lot of organizations because who wants to write the desktop version of their application uh, and then have to write completely different code f for uh, the web? Who wants to write two different things, right? One for the web and one for, for the desktop. When you can get away, in many cases, like we've seen with some pretty big projects, things like Slack, things like VS Code, you can really get away with, with having the same code power both things. Um, so, you know, the, that, that's got some important implications, I think, for resourcing, um, for moving quickly, getting projects done quickly. Um, I think it gives, gives a lot of companies an opportunity as well to put a desktop application out for their products when maybe they wouldn't consider that, um, you know, if, if this technology wasn't around, if Electron wasn't around. So there's some pretty cool, pretty cool implications of, of this being available, I think. Hey, Lucas. Yo, how's it going? Good, you? Good. So I just jumped into the middle of this conversation. Um, I'm presuming you're extolling the virtues of Electron, which you and I have been in the trenches on. Um, did you mention uh, bypassing like legacy browser restrictions within an organization by any chance? I have not mentioned that, no. Do you have some thoughts <laughs> on that? Well, so one of the things that I run into quite a bit is... Um, you're developing, especially like an internal app for like a large corporation. So let's assume like, you know, fortune 100 or something like that. And it's like, Hey, we would love to do that. But unfortunately all the browsers in the organization were on like IE eight because it, you know, hasn't collectively made the decision to, you know, move to like a new browser or allow us to use Chrome. So definitely within, you know, large corporations I've seen where they have very, um, a specific set of. Um, or a, usually a specific browser that is supported internally. And, uh, you know, you want to implement features that is not supported on that particular browser. And so one of the ways around that is to basically release your web application in Electron. And because, you know, one of the beauties of that is, so for instance, with the, the MIDI stuff that I did at ng-conf, I didn't have to think about browser support because it was, I was just basically using the latest version of Chrome. I got all the goodness. And then you just wrap it up in Electron. And so that's a way to distribute right. kind of cutting edge like browser features within an internal organization and not have to worry about, you know, supporting like IE8, IE9, yeah. et cetera. So that's, that's another thing on kind of the enterprise side that, that has come up. And um, I, I've seen it be, you know, successful, you know, in that context as well. That's cool. Yeah, I suppose too, like depends on what your distribution model can allow for, right? Because if you have, if you want to distribute only a desktop application, then that's a good way to circumvent some of those, um, you know, the, those roadblocks. But if you have to go through the browser, right? Like if you have to be able to distribute through the browser directly as well, then you might be back to some of those, those problems. But uh, certainly that, that seems like it would make sense in a lot of organizations where things are closed off, where there's kind of some siloing happening with in terms of what, what organizations are able to use. So, yeah, I agree, but it is an option. And yep. I think whereas before it's like, there's no way we could do this. It's like, well, you know, one, it, it comes down to a lot of variables, but it's like, you know, how, how does this have to be you know, distributed? And when you can just say, you know, here's this, you know, um, you know, installable, this installer, you know, internally go ahead and grab this and run this. Um, that's a way to kind of circumvent some of the, um, some of those restrictions and uh, get things done in the meantime. Definitely. Absolutely. So you've, you've done that in some of your work, have you? Uh, so I have pointed people in that direction um, to do that. So it's a little bit more on like maybe a smaller scale, mm. but even, you know, internally we've got like a small internal app. This is what we want to do. Like, uh Oh, it's not going to work, you know, on this particular browser. Mm. And so it's just like, well, um, you know, just wrap it in Electron and it's, uh, it's not a problem. So I've, I've definitely in more than one place in this context made that recommendation. Mm. And, um, you know, to the best of my knowledge, uh, that was um, the course of action that they took and it worked well. Yeah, cool. 
I'm ki- so one question I've got for you, Lucas. Like, I mean, we've uh, you know we worked together on <clears throat> obviously on the workshop that we did at at, at NGConf. Um, one of the questions that one of the things we talked about thus far is you know how do you get what do you do to get a project an electron project working with uh, Angular and maybe in particular the Angular CLI. Um, and so, is there any particular kind of setup and organization to that that you like um, over over another? Um, I, I think that you and I are kind of on the same page for for how we we set up our projects. But I, I I'm curious if you found any other kind of ways to do it that that maybe kind of give some some benefit. So one of the the ways that I like to set it up is to basically copy over. Basically, make, make an electron folder in the project, and in there you would have your main JS file, which would which would be what you'd use to wire up your main process, and then you'd have a, a small package.json file there, and then you would um, copy wh- whenever you run your application, you'd basically just clone those. You'd copy those over to your distribution folder, and you would instruct through an npm script or whatever the case may be. You instruct electron to uh, basically run the project against what's in that distribution folder. And so you would need, you would need your main JS file in there. You would need an index.html, uh, and you would need a package.json. So that, I mean, that seems to be a pretty smooth approach as far as I've been, um, as far as I've experienced, but I'm curious to know if you have come across anything that's, that's any better. No, I think that is, um, the easiest. And so this is what we did at the workshop. Um, there is, uh, previously, I still felt like adding, you know, an angular or angular into an electron application was pretty easy, uh-huh. but with the CLI, it's, it's quite a bit easier than that. And there is a, a post by a gentleman named, um, Bruno Daria, I believe. And, um, so if you just Google angular CLI electron, it's like one of the top ones. And this is kind of how I approach this now is I do an angular CLI app. I create an electron directory. And you know, that's where I put my package.json, my main.json. And what I will do there is just, you go to the Electron Quick Start, you just copy that main JS pretty much like ad hoc, uh, drop it in, and update your base ref. And a few things that you can add to your NPM script, and boom, you're done. So you can literally take an Angular CLI project, turn it into Electron um, application in like three minutes three to five minutes and that's, you know, going, you know, just, I'm reading this thing, I'm doing it, you know, copy, paste, boom, done. Mm. I would say if you do that, you know, more than once, you could probably get it down to about 60 seconds. And so I think we're on, I think we do it the same way as Angular CLI, create your electron folder, um, dump the electron stuff in there and um, update your NPM scripts to have like a build electron, Mm. um, run electron, you know, commands and you're good to go. So that is, I mean, just making that switch from like, Web app to Electron app is, I mean, it's like three minutes worth of work. And, you know, for that is, I think it opens up some really compelling opportunities. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. That's, that's one of the things that I was, I think it was before you joined, I was mentioning is that there's a lot of opportunity, I think, for companies who otherwise wouldn't be building a desktop application or wouldn't be thinking about it to kind of complement their, their web app. Um, it gives them a ton of opportunity to do that now. I think there's a market for that too in a lot of products. I think people like to see a desktop version of certain applications, right? It's kind of, it, it, it can certainly provide a nice experience. You know, you just pop it open when your computer starts or whatever the case may be. Um, or if you're doing things that are only supported on, on desktop, then it's uh, certainly a, can be a win that way. So one thing I am wondering about then, you know, because, you know, you have these build processes and things, you know, we do the ahead of time compilation and things like that in, in a regular Angular web app, how important are all of these processes that we put around our applications in an Electron app where it's probably just loading the JavaScript files off of the off of the machine that we're sitting on? Yeah. So in that sense, the worrying about things like network latency and... This episode is sponsored by Newbie Remote Conf. Newbie Remote Conf is a two-day completely virtual conference hosted by none other than Charles Max Wood. If travel expenses are an issue or you just can't afford to be away from home for two days, then join us. It's virtual. The conference is focused on people who want to keep up with the latest in programming or just get a leg up in getting a job and getting into the programming community. 
We'll have speakers from all over the programming community to help you stay current and a Slack room where you can connect with speakers and other attendees in real time. We'll also have a live roundtable video chat for attendees and speakers, plus we'll provide the talk recordings to you within days of the conference. Early bird tickets are available for $150 until May 12th, and the call for proposals is open until April 28th. So come join us at newbieremoteconf.com. Put around our applications in an Electron app where it's probably just loading the JavaScript files off of the off of the machine that we're sitting on. Yeah. So in that sense, the worrying about things like network latency and bundle sizes and, and, and stuff like that, those perhaps become less important. Um, I, did, I wouldn't be able to tell you about like benchmarking for, for how you might um, make some kind of assessment about whether it matters in an electron application, but presumably it's a, it, it matters less so than, than if you're dealing with uh, an app served over the web. Um, at our workshop, it was interesting. We were, we were talking about whether or not it's, uh, it's at all worthwhile to do lazy loading in an electron application. If you're, if you're making an angular app to, to work with electron and someone in our workshop, the, the Lucas and I did, uh, got it working, got it wired up to do lazy loading within the electron application. But, um, you know, some people were of the opinion that, well, does it really matter? Like it, is lazy loading, should we really consider it to be a big deal at all? I mean, if you're not, it, if if the case is that you're going to have all of the assets and everything that that are required right off the bat, then you know maybe it's not such a big deal to implement something like lazy loading. But uh, anyway, at least one one participant in our workshop felt that it was uh, a good idea, and he he got it working. So the there's certainly the possibility there to implement these these features of Angular that that make it work well over the web. But perhaps there's there's less reason to for, in a lot of cases. One other question that I'm I'm kind of wondering about is um, desktop apps tend to need to do things that web apps don't, um, like access the file system and stuff like that. So do you create a backend with Node or do you just so, generally do a lot of that through API calls that are just available through the, the system that you're using? Yeah, so you can kind of think of it as... Um, as if you're writing an app. So when you, when you write an app in Node, you've got access to the file system, right? You've got the uh-huh. FS module and you've got, you've got all sorts of other modules that, that let you interact with the file system and, and do stuff that's privileged to the, the computer you're on. And so it kind of works out to be the same with an Electron application because you're writing um, parts of it in Node, or at least you, you can and, and certainly um, probably should. There are um, there are ways then for you to interact with the file system, right? So you can pull in the FS module and you can write things to the file system. You can read from the file system, um, and you can you basically have this privileged access uh, that that web applications don't have. <clears throat> so it's possible then to do these these things that you would normally do in desktop desktop applications that that web apps shouldn't be able to to do. And, and that happens through basically through you writing stuff in Node. So Node would be the the actual thing interacting with the file system on the computer. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. So does that mean you would have to change like your calls and stuff based on what type of like if it was on Linux or something versus um, like if you're on a Mac or a PC? Do do any of those change if you're like talking to the file system or not really? So there are like in general terms, it's the answer is no. Like you're going to have this one kind of API to to make the application usable multi-platform. Um, however, there are, I, I believe there are some cases where you need to do things in a certain way to cater to a particular operating system. Like I, I think in some cases you would do a check for the operating system that you're on. You know, and if it's Mac, you you do things this way. If it's Linux, you do it another way. Um, I don't have any real life examples of that, but I think I've kind of seen some of that in the exploration that I've done. The menu, the menu so being one. Like in your in your toolbar, like Windows has some like distinct APIs for like you know when you mouse over, you can actually get like a thumbnail of like 
a screen within your application, whereas like Linux doesn't really have that concept. So there are like a few kind of UI things that are, are specific to a platform um, that you kind of need to, you know, dial in on depending on what you're doing where, okay, this is on Windows and I want some specific fun functionality within, you know, when it's in the toolbar, um, how that's actually docked and what it looks like versus, you know, in Linux, you're going to have to, you know, it doesn't work quite the same. Right. But in all those cases, you get this JavaScript API basically that you use to, to make those things happen. But do you and just so I don't know. do you just call those as as though you loaded another web available library, or are you calling into you know the essentially a, a back end that's the main node process? Um, so the like the way that you would interact with it, I, I don't know, like kind of how you'd you'd structure your conditionals or whatever. Like, what the best way to do that would would be maybe Lucas, because you, you've kind of gone through the the steps there with the Linux menu. Maybe you have kind of the best way to do that. But um, in terms of like where you call your code from to do those things, a lot of these these things that you would do with the the application kind of in a native way. So like control the menu items and that sort of thing that's it's handled from the main process for the application mm -hmm. so if you were say you were like interacting with the ui as a user and you you want to use the developer wanted to make some kind of action that the user takes change the menu or, or something like that you've got to call from your renderer process which is what the user sees over to your main process okay. which is what powers the application to begin with. Um, and what, how you do that is through this concept called IPC, which is inter-process communication. Um, and basically it's this bridge from one process to another. And it enables this, this kind of, it, it works on an event system. So you, you can, can call um, through events, you can listen for events and you can, you can respond to them uh, amongst bo both those processes. So, uh, so that's kind of how it shakes out. But Lucas, do you have any thoughts on that menu? Like in particular, in particular, how you'd structure that menu thing? I mean, so generally just, you know, I think really clean code applies in the sense of like, you know, you would just introduce, you know, some kind of um, check of like, you know, what platform am I on? And then you would abstract, you know, kind of these implementations into smaller, you know, fine-grained functions that would then call that. Um, so, I mean, it's just like, you know, a standard kind of like, you know, like think of like, you know, any kind of logic structure of like if, else, or, you know, switch is that, um, you know, you just detect the platform and you just say, if it's on this, then, you know, go ahead and implement, you know, this thing and do it this way. If not, do it this way. And, um, and that's, you know, pretty much how it comes together is you have to just kind of introduce some logic structures around the platform and then a code accordingly. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like, you know, when you are doing things that interacts with like the native operating system, is it, you know, because the main process is node that it looks very much like a node application in terms of, you know, just really how you would structure it, um, how you would do, you know, even like, like your file access stuff and those different things is, you know, it's just like if you're just writing it for node, um, it pretty much just carries over and it looks almost identical. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's um, so, you know, that there's another spot where you leverage existing skills, right? So if you're, if you're a front end developer, that's, that's one thing where you can port your skills over to Electron. Uh, you know, you can use whatever framework you, you're using. So whether it be Angular, React or Vue or, or whatever, you can use that for the actual UI layer. But the, if you're a full stack developer and you're using node on your backends, so you've got that skill to port over as well. Um, so it's, it's a pretty approachable um, kind of platform in that way. If you, if you've already got that experience. All right. Well, we're right around that half hour mark where we usually start looking to wrap up, but um, are there more things that uh, people should be able to do with an electron app pretty easily that they're going to find they want to do over the course of their development. Um, so Lucas, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. So um, I would say that and we keep coming back to like NG comp. That was really an opportunity for me to like where I really spent a lot of time thinking about electron from the workshop that we did, but also to 
um, the presentation that I did of Mischief Maker. And I think the thing that really kind of stuck out to me is that, um, you know, just take everything that you're doing um, for web and just, you know, translating that into a desktop application is really, really easy. So if you go and if you haven't seen um, the presentation I did with Roger and myself, that entire um, uh, application that I was running was in fact in a complete electron application. So, you know, we went up, set up, as I clicked, you know, the app icon on my desktop, I actually had an alias, but then it popped up. And so the slides were, um, what I did is there's like a, like an NG, like full page thing where somebody just wrapped this kind of jQuery, like full page library in Angular. And I was able to port that in. And so now I have this full page um, desktop application running in kiosk mode, and then I was able to hook in, you know, the MIDI controllers and, and the different things. Is that on one hand, like anything you can do in the web, you can now do um, outside of that in the in the desktop environment, which I think opens up, you know, just kind of a, a bunch of interesting possibilities. Because in conjunction with that, then you have access to really all of the underlying um, things that you know is available to, as um, in the context of your native operating system. And so when I think of Electron is I think of everything that we know and that we've been doing, we can now take that and have an out of browser experience. And so that is, I would encourage everybody to just kind of play around and, and think about like, what are the things that I'm doing in the browser and how much further can I take it now that I'm out of the browser, if you will, and now in a kind of a desktop environment it definitely i think it gives you a lot more freedom to do uh, some some really interesting and expressive things i agree with that yeah for sure i think it's it's really like the possibilities that come up when you like you said lucas like when you take your browser-based app and then put it in a, a desktop desktop format um get really exciting right because then you can start adding other kind of, you know, other features to your app in the desktop variety that you wouldn't be able to in the, in the web app, um, which I think is, is pretty neat. I like the idea of being able to have something in the taskbar. So something up top on, if you're on Mac, that gives you notifications about various pieces of data that come in and go out of your application. Um, and, you know, we're starting to see stuff, like in the web, like we've seen recently push notifications um, come to the web, but I think there's a lot more opportunity still in the desktop variety that we can explore. And even to that, actually, I would say one of the big things um, that I don't really think about, but it just came to me is a lot of times you'll see something in the desktop or something. And because it's written in, you know, generally some native thing, um, it's like, I have no idea how to do this. Mm -hmm. But when you think about it in the sense of like JavaScript of, you know, so you take something you see in the desktop and you're like, well, if that was like a web app, like I would totally know how to build that. Like, you know, even like your taskbar stuff of like, oh, well, that's just a menu and some buttons that you click and you do stuff. Mm -hmm. And so whereas for me, like desktop stuff, and I don't actually particularly like doing native development, um, just, I don't know, I just don't have fun when I do it. And so there's things that I've seen in, you know, especially with being on a Mac, there's a lot of really gorgeous applications and it's like, man, like, I wonder how they did that. And the idea of doing this in, you know, Objective C or whatever is like, you know, forget it, like, no interest. But if somebody's like, well, could you do that in the browser? What would that look like? Yeah. It's like, well, okay, that's approachable. And I know how I, I would do it that way. Well, now when you start looking at everything that you see in the native context is a JavaScript application, I would wager most of us have a pretty good idea of how to get it, you know, to that. Like, how would you do it in the browser? And then you just flip it back into the desktop. And so mm -hmm. I think that's the big thing is like now, like I see all these things. I'm like, I could totally do that in JavaScript. Ergo, I can now do it as a desktop application. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. The barrier to entry becomes a lot lower, I think. Yep. True story, bro. <laughs> what about uh, your favorite learning resources for this sort of stuff? What, what's our favorite learning resources? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the electron docs are actually very good. I, um, I'm a big fan of great docs and that's why Joe, I love your site so much. 
Um, <laughs> but uh, the electron docks are, are great. So if you are approaching it for the first time, I would say check that out as a primary learning resource and you can you can pick up quite a bit from it. When I was learning Electron, I kind of, um, you know, for me, because I was I was bringing in Angular, there wasn't a lot around at the time for how to put those things together. Um, so it was it was some trial and error for me at that point. Um, there are quite a few more things available now, and so you know there there are some starter projects and some some great blog posts that'll that'll help get you going. Um, and I can certainly point people there. Maybe we're going to do picks. I think right, Chuck. We can maybe. This is was going to be one of my picks. Was uh, was one of these repos, so I can hold off until then to to mention it. But uh, but yeah, there there you know just Google Angular plus Electron, you'll get some some great blog posts and and, and starter kits, and that would be the best way to start. I think just start hacking on something, start hacking yeah. on a ready to go project. If I could piggyback on that, um, I'll tell just a, a quick anecdotal story. As I was talking to Adam Bradley about Ionic, and I said like Adam, like how do I become a really good Ionic developer. And he's like, well, um, do you know Angular? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, well, what I would recommend is become a really good Angular developer and you're practically, you know, a really good Ionic developer at that point. And when you think of Electron in the context of Angular, because you can really do anything there, but if you want to be a really good um, Electron developer in the context of Angular, I would just say, you know, really become a good Angular developer and focus on building great stuff in Angular. And then... From there, it just flips over into a Electron. But I think, Alyssa, do you want to do your picks real quick? Come she, on. she already she no. jumped off. No. <laughs> it's sad. I was going to, I thought I saw her typing. So anyways, chop this out. Uh, but that's where I would say is learn how to do interesting things in Angular and then pick them up. In, and just translated right over into Electron. And my experience is that it's been really, really easy. Almost too easy. Like, is this a trap? And, you know, that's, it feels like you're walking into a trap because it generally, like, there's nothing to it. So one other question that I have related to this is something that you made me think about a little bit. If somebody is new or new-ish to Angular, is this something that they, they could start with? like doing this in Electron? Or is that too many things to pick up at once? My, like if I was advising somebody in that way, I'd probably say, you know, start with some baby steps with Angular, get going in the browser first, get used to using the Angular CLI. In fact, you know, with Angular, it might even be advisable if you want to, to, to start without the CLI, try to, try to get things together just so you can start to understand how build processes work and, and what's needed to to make an, an Angular application go. Um, and then you can kind of use use that once you've, you've built off that platform, start to get Electron uh, into the mix. And the nice thing at that point is you're, you're not going to have a whole lot more overhead to, to get an Electron application going. Really, you, you know, you change around a couple of files, you add, you add a couple of files, you add some NPM scripts to, to do some file copying and then some to, to run the Electron process and, and you're, you're off and ready to go. But I would certainly recommend if you're totally new to Angular, just start, start small, start with a, a browser-based application. What do you think, Lucas? I would agree. Um, again, learn how to build something in the browser and then you know, think about making that switch to you know, kind of the desktop and not kind of go from there. But generally, um, especially, and again, is, are they new to programming, new to Angular? Um, you know, that will kind of also affect you know, even how I would have them approach in, you know, Angular itself. But you know, the idea is to... And this, I would actually disagree with you on this, Ryan, mm -hmm. is that I think... When you're learning something, I think it's important to basically learn how to build something as quickly as possible and, you know, just get your foot wet. And so I would say start with the Angular CLI mm -hmm. yeah. because there's almost zero barrier to entry and, you know, just do the hello world and start to do a couple things. And then I would recommend, you know, kind of stepping back and figuring out how that actually works. Um, certainly in my day to day work, like I would never sit down and build out, you know, an entire build system by hand. But it's still good to know how that's working and you know what is happening. So even in workshops, I you know I say, look, you know, even though you can generate things with Angular CLI, it's not a crutch. 
And so, you know, do that by hand until you build up the, me- the muscle memory. And then from there, you can use the generator, and I do, or I set up live templates to eliminate some of those redundant tasks, but only after I intimately know what's happening. And I would say at least one time, take and, you know, walk through and put the pieces together that go into the Angular CLI so you know how it works. Yeah. Um, even with libraries like NGRX, I know Todd Motto, um, he dug in and he kind of built his own version of the NGRX store. And people were like, well, you, like, you know, like NGRX exists. And he's like, true. But, you know, when you actually go through and build something on your own, mm-hmm. you know, scratch, that's when you really like learn it and you can appreciate what it actually does. So for sure. And that that's kind of the sentiment that I was going after is through that process of kind of digging in, looking under the hood, you start to understand. And it takes time to do that. Like it's a, it's a time consuming thing, especially if you're trying to wire up Webpack and, and get everything going, or at least it can be a time consuming thing, especially if you're, you're new to it. Um, it certainly helps with the understanding. So I would, I would kind of amend my stance to, to say that, yes, true. For the very first touch, I would say just get something easy going with the CLI, but don't, don't rely on it. Um, if you if you don't fully understand kind of what's happening under the hood, or even if you, I should say, I should say this: if you don't have like um, kind of at least a general knowledge or a decent understanding of of what the CLI is helping with, then take some time to to understand those pieces by um, you know doing it by hand. Uh, use the CLI as a tool as you go on because it saves you time. Um, but but maybe don't use it as your the as a crutch right out of the gate, so that you get to a point where maybe you can develop things in Angular, but you don't necessarily kind of understand what's what's happening uh, under the hood, even to to a bit of a degree. That would be my uh, that would that would just be my my advice. And and that's that that I think it helps. I think once you get further on um, in your knowledge of Angular or any you know modern framework for that matter, kind of having an understanding of okay, well. You know, if I open up, uh, if I view source on this and I look at what this bundle.js thing is and it looks all weird, um, kind of knowing the underlying process that's happening uh, in the CLI is help for, helpful for you to understand uh, kind of these, these other things that you'll see later on. So that's my thought. Here, here. I agree. All right. Does your team need to master AngularJS? Oasis Digital offers Angular Bootcamp, a three-day in-person workshop class for individuals or teams. Bring us to your site or send developers to ours, angularbootcamp.com. All right, well, let's go ahead and do some picks. Uh, Joe, do you have some picks for us? You betcha. I'm all about the picks. <laughs> um. So I've been watching this TV show because a buddy of mine recommended it and it's a cartoon called Gravity Falls and I found it to be so hilarious. It's one of those shows that's a cartoon for kids, but it has enough subtle humor that for adults to watch, it's actually really entertaining and funny and it's kind of like a cartoon version of, I don't know, X-Files, uh, something like that. Really fun show, having a bunch of fun watching it. So I'm going to pick that, Gravity Falls. Uh, also... Myself, John, Papa, and Dan Walleen are going to be teaching a three-day workshop on Angular, the a kind of an introduction to Angular, the current version, and uh, you know version four plus testing Angular down in Irvine, California, in July. If you want to check that out, it's, head over to TopCoders.io. Those are my picks. All right, Lucas, what are your picks? So I have two picks this week. Uh, the first one is I recently applied for TSA PreCheck, and uh, just the other day I used it, and it is amazing. So if you have the opportunity to register for TSA PreCheck, it's worth eighty-five bucks. Um, I've How much time did you save at the airport? Oh my goodness! Like <laughs> you don't even have to unpack your bags. Like you show up, you put them on the conveyor belt, and you, like you just walk through a metal like thing, like the metal oh. detector. Yeah, it did was. You have to take off your shoes? It just took one time to go. You don't have it. to I'm take like, off your shoes. Nope. Nope. No shoes. You don't have to unpack your bag either. So they don't make you take out like your liquids or <laughs> your laptop. Nothing. It was just like here, boom, done. You know, three minutes in, I'm like, this is the best 85 bucks I've ever spent in my life. So fun fact in Canada, where I am, you don't have to take off your shoes at the airport when you're going through. And I always get a little bit wigged out when I go to the States and I have to do so. 
But that's great to hear about TSA. <laughs> well, the problem is, Ryan, is you're colorblind, and so your socks never match, and everybody's laughing, but you still that's don't know why. Like, like, why are people looking at my feet? And exactly. I'm just exactly. kidding. I don't, I don't <laughs> like colorblind, but that actually would be like embarrassing and hilarious if you were. Um, yeah, red is the new green, right? That's right. So I I'm really wearing like, a red shirt, or green shirt, right? This yeah, I like your I like your green shirt there. That's, that's pretty <laughs> sweet. And um, so my second uh, pick is I've been reading the Jazz Theory book by uh, Mark Levine, and just slowly going through it, um, and just uh, trying to really kind of wrap my mind and really go deeper into music theory. And um, I have a, one of my friends who is a, quite an accomplished musician and just, you know, step by step going through that. But um, the Jazz Theory book, uh, Mark does this really good job of breaking like the theory down into small um, digestible pieces and just been working through the uh, the 251 chord progression around the circle of fifths and um, I'm in a really good time. So it's, it's a great book. It's like 30 bucks. And uh, I recommend it to anybody who is interested in you know, playing playing jazz. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, I'm going to plus one you on the TSA pre-check thing because <clears throat> I have it and I, I wound up flying more and more often as the years go on. And it's so nice just to be able to, yeah, walk up, drop my bag, pull out any metal out of my pockets and then just go through the metal detector. Yep. That's great. Um, so uh, I'm going to throw out a few picks here. Um, the first one is um, something that I wind up using on a regular basis. So um, a lot of folks may or may not have heard, but I have uh, ditched the Mac ecosystem. My laptop's still a Mac, but my main development machine and work machine is a Windows desktop machine that I built myself because I just didn't feel like I could get what I wanted from the Mac um, ecosystem from the latest updates to the MacBook Pro. So um, anyway, yeah, and I wound up saving myself like two grand off of what it would have cost to get what I wanted. But anyway, um, one of the things I use on a regular basis is the bash on Ubuntu um, emulator on Windows. And I, I really like it. It has a few little glitches here or there. But I mean, generally, it just works fine as a, as a bash console and uh, does everything that I need. So um, I've been pretty happy with that. And then um, the other thing that I'm going to pick is um, something that I'm using more in in the business these days. And I know I've picked it in the past, but I just love it. So I probably wind up picking it every few months. And that Zapier, um, I just found out that it'll actually connect to um, QuickBooks Online. So if somebody, you know, pays me for something, then I can set it up so I get a notification in Slack or a text message or something like that. And that's very helpful for just keeping track of what's been paid and when and why and who and all that stuff. So anyway, um, been really happy with that. I guess I'll throw one more pick in there, and that's a, a follow-up system that I'm using um, to bring people onto the shows and... Um, you know, let them know when things have come out and stuff like that. And that's called, it's blue tick. It's at blue tick.io. Um, I, I may have mentioned it on the show before. I haven't been keeping track if I'm repeating picks, but, um, anyway, it's, it's really nice and it's in beta. So, um, you go and you get on the list and then Mike will email you and onboard you himself. And yeah, he's, he's just trying to make sure that it works for everybody. So yeah. So those are my picks. Um, Brian, do you have some picks for us? I do. Yeah, I've got a few here. So I will sort of um, start out with ones that might help you if you're wanting to explore Electron, especially Electron with Angular. And the first would be a, um, a starter project that I've come across that looks to be pretty good. It looks to be maintained. Um, I don't typically rely on starter projects now. I just wire things up with the, the CLI. But uh, if you want something that has Angular and Electron ready to go, um, I would check out the Angular Dash Electron project uh, by a guy named I don't know how to pronounce his first name Shao Garin perhaps it's J O A O G A R I N and he's got an Angular Dash Electron repo that should get you going pretty quickly. Uh, the second one, and this will be a shout out to my pal Lucas, I would recommend that you check out his Mischief Maker repo. And this is the uh, this is the application that he built for his talk at NGConf. And it will blow your mind. It is, uh, it is quite something to behold. So I would check that out. And Lucas, I just want to make sure the one that's on GitHub, that's like the final one, right? Like that's, that's, that was your, the one you went with at the conference? Yep. 
And so okay. actually, I, I've blogged about it. Um, so if you go to One Hungry Mind, um, just kind of the, the the things that I use to set that up, um, there's some commentary around it. So it's um, being kind of funny. Actually, I wasn't trying to be funny, and I realized it was. Um, <laughs> I was just like, I'm going to put down my notes about Angular and MIDI. And I realized, ah, music notes, that's funny. And um, so if you go to 100mind.com, I kind of actually talk about um, how I did that. And so one follow-up pick is uh, Ryan. Again, I feel like we're just like BFFs here. Um, he actually just released a happy uh, workshop on front-end masters. And so I've had the opportunity to actually uh, present a couple of workshops with Ryan and I've always enjoyed them. And so uh, this is actually in my queue to go through. So um, front-end masters, Ryan Chenke's, uh happy workshop. And uh, it's pretty rad. So um, thank you. Yeah, cool. And that's uh, so thanks, Lucas. Um, my last pick would be this app that I came across and I haven't actually used it yet. So I can't give a full review, but it looks amazing. And we've, we've gotten good reviews at work. Um, so at All Zero, we are very distributed as a company. So we've got people in almost every time zone. Um, and the app that I would recommend is called Clocker. Um, so you can uh, Google it. I'm sure clocker app or something like that. Maybe actually I'll just try to find very quickly the, uh, the URL here and I can put it in the show notes or whatever, but, um, clocker, it basically gives you this app that sits in your taskbar and you can set, um, any number of time zones you want. And it allows you to look at what time it is for any of your colleagues that you want to uh, check time zones on. And you can uh, fast forward ahead in time to like see what time it'll be for them at a certain time for you and that kind of thing uh, through a slider. So it looks really nifty. I'm definitely going to install it right after this. I know at work, we're getting some good reviews on it. And um, yeah, so check it out. There'll be a link for it uh, that I'll give to you, Chuck. And uh, it's possible that it's built with Electron. I don't know. I'm going to check it out. If it is, I think that's pretty cool. All right. And if people want to follow you or see what you're doing, um, where should they go? I mean, Twitter account, GitHub account, blog. Sure thing. Yeah. So you can check me out in a couple of places. Uh, on Twitter, I'm at Ryan Chanky, C-H-E-N-K-I-E. I am also on GitHub and my GitHub handle is my last name, Chanky. And you can find me uh, at angularcast.io. That's where I teach about Angular and many more things too, kind of everything you would need to do end-to-end development. So full stack developments, but focusing primarily on Angular. So that's angularcast.io. And then I blog at ryanchanky.com. Awesome. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap this show up and we'll catch you all next week. All right. Thanks, guys. This was fun. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com to learn more.